and the audience. Uh, uh, my, my task was to, to answer the question whether it is so serious. Um, these are my conflicts of, of interest. And, you know, it's like, um, I'll start with a vignette, and a, quite a typical one, you know, it's like you admit a patient, he is, in the beginning in shock, he is fluid responsive, so you add some fluids and you add some fluids, and on to day two or three, you end up with someone who is having a high big problem with PAU to FEO to ratio, having high and extravascular lung water, and literally he's drowning. Um, and okay, we, we, we spoke about hypervolemia, so he may be in hypervolemia, he may have an increased postcapillary pressure and which leads to edema. And we know that there is a disbalance in, in the telial dysfunction, increasing permeability, increasing edema. Also, this edema leads to tissue hypoxemia and tissue hypoxemia leads further on, on one side to pulmonary edema, decreasing the tension of oxygen, and on the other side, uh, the waste products are much more osmogenic, so they maintain the, the, the water within the interstitium. And to sum up the effects, the hydrostatic pressure leads to compartments, and also there is a higher risk of decreased contractility because of the heart being uh, interstitially uh, um, edematous, and there is a kidney injury. So at the end of the day, you end up with something like this, your patient looks like this, and I have to answer whether this is serious or not. You won't be sitting here if it won't be serious, right? But okay, there was one big man in the history of Lindy Card, and he told us to doubt everything. So, the first question I'd ask is whether we as doctors are really to blame. And this this publication was already mentioned, or when this is the one, the, the original one by, by, um, by Lata when he first infused uh, crystalloids to, to people with cholera. And he was over optimistic about the treatment with fluids. That the, he has no doubt that there will be found that that's the, one of the safest remedies we ever had. We know that there is a separation between the intravascular and the extravascular water, and we know that in shock states there is this vascular barrier disrupted and there is accumulation in an interstitium. And in some patients, there is a leak from the vascular content itself. Also, we know that the plasma content is the only one we can reach with our medication, being fluid responsive or unresponsive. This is the place we can infuse in, but the water then goes into interstitium and goes into cellular space. And the studies by Robert Hahn, there's a number of studies, number of publications, and altogether the half-life half of fluids in our bodies, in volunteers or the anesthesia patients, were up to, up to six hours. And especially in ICU patients, though you deal with, you know, much longer. But vice versa, the volume effect it's much shorter, it's significantly shorter, it's within minutes. So we have a big disproportion between the desired effect and the side effect. Also, we know that in shock states there is an issue with the vascular tone, and nowadays we know that there are possible treatments which may help us to decrease or to shrink the circulation. So there is something, we have not only fluids, we can also use vasopressors, and either or, it's with a lower fluid balance. But nevertheless, as meant by Manu, we have hypovolemia in these complications, hypervolemia in these complications. We are somewhere between skill and courage. There is a sweet spot, but again, coming from anesthesia. We know that the sweet spot's one, no, the sweet spot will be different for different organs in our body. So at the end of the day, it's not only one, we are not the ones only to blame. There is no way not giving fluid. And the fluid accumulation is a known side effect, but yes, it's still serious. Okay. René Descartes may ask me if it's not an epiphenomenon. Heaps of literature that fluid overload of cumulative balance is associated with problems. What's kind of strange is that in some studies, that's the fluid balance on the day one. In some, it's starting day four. And also, the risk is 
1.05, what if it's just an epiphenomenon? Higher severity means worse microcirculation, means higher fluid intake, and so on and so on, the vicious circle I started with. If you look on the data of most of these big trials, you will see that really the fluid intake is one of those uh, multivariates responsible for the higher risk. But the same, and actually with the same amount of risk, is the original severity of the patient. But twice or three times more is the ability of the body to get rid of the fluids. So there is one, which is the doctor's doing, and there is the other, which is the kidney doing. Okay, if you look in the, in, in the epiphenom measure, so, so if it's a severity of the patient behind, in this nice study, of course, dose being in a positive balance, had higher apache, had higher sofa, less AKI, less pneumonia. So we can see that that's not only fluid balance, but also they were looking time-wise, day one, two, and three, whether it will change the risk. And in those who are beginning, uh, positive in the beginning, and becoming negative, they did better, vice versa those who were positive, negative, and then becoming positive again, did worse. So, okay, but still, it's serious. Nevertheless, if it's a patient or the accumulation itself, it is a bad signal, either of the bad condition of the patient or bad job done. What's this actually? So how we calculate the fluid balance? The daily fluid balance, it's usually on one side, the daily intake, especially if you have the electronic records. On the other side, the, what you get out of the patient. But if you calculate this, there is an insensible error. There's evaporation, there may be bleeding, other losses. So each day at the bedside, you look at the number, and the number you have to admire, or have you admit that there is an error. And when you calculate cumulative flight balance, that's a cumulative error. So we possibly have to try to find a better day, better way. We spoke about fluid accumulation, and fluid accumulation is the weight increase so maybe weighting the patient may be the way. Fluid overload, again, and parameter assess in most of the study and associated with the outcome is a cumulative field balance and admission weight. But if you calculate, you have a cumulative error and surgical error. If you weight, you may have an intestinal error. Nevertheless, I told you, it's a signal. It's a signal of severity. Then, okay, let's admit and ask what's the, what's the number we usually say it's about 10%. 10% is good in, uh, in, in medicine. It's like when something's 10%, then we usually say it's, it means. But at the end of the day, it's fluid accumulation. We are giving fluids to increase the intravascular volume. We know something will leak out. We know something will be urinated or get out of the body. And this is also the fluid accumulation itself. There will be some effectiveness of what I gave. There will be something which is the excretion ability. And we said that kidney is one of the major drivers of the severity. And there should be something like a leak portion. Fluid accumulation in this very patient who receives six liters in intake, but urinated most of it will be at the end of the day the same as in the one who received two liters and urinated 800 ml. Both these patients will end up in your charts having the same fluid balance of the day, right? But if you will just look what happened with the water or with the infusions given, then the patient on the right side actually accumulated either intravascularly or in the interstitium in cells, significantly higher portion of the intake. 
and you end up in the charts with the same number. So maybe we should add something more, and this fluid accumulation index is actually quite a good idea. Of course, if you have someone who is bleeding in the very beginning, and then he will have a high fluid accumulation, and it won't be that risky. But if you have a septic case, not bleeding one, then a high fluid accumulation index may be a mark of severity. And what about vascular leak? Okay, another study trying to look into the amount of water which is leaking out. And okay, not measuring it properly, but looking in the lab. Because we know that the red blood cells, when not leaking out from the circulation, are able to give us a note what remain in the circulation. And the vascular leak index was... Okay, this was a big data coming from ICU Amsterdam and MIMIC studies, but all of them correlated nicely with the increase and the calculation based on the hematocrite and fluid balance lead it up that the <coughs> vascular leak can be enumerized, you can calculate it and find the place. So okay, it is still serious, but it's complex. It's not only calculated what goes in and what goes out. And we should not simplify it. We should possibly look in more detail where do the accumulation goes to. So to conclude, fluids are still necessary. It's a treatment, but we have to admit, with a serious side effects. Fluid accumulation is a serious warning side at any case. My job, patient, kidney, still serious and it's complex we should not oversimplify but also not overemphasize because there are limits of our calculation so we have to admit fluid accumulation is serious and i will end up with the same picture manu had it's just those what matters okay thank you so much for your attention <clears throat> Thank you, Ian Benz, for the nice talk. Uh, I would like to ask if there is any question from the audience. And I'd like to remember that there are a few empty places here. You must come. There are many people there. Is there any question from the audience? We should remember that you can send us questions through the app also. Yeah, what do you think that, uh, why is there a gap between what we have published in the last years about fluid accumulation and the bedside clinical practice? Extremely good question. You know, I remember that several years ago, <coughs> the Fenice trial was published. And it was in the moment when we start spoke, talking about fluid responsiveness. And we start talking about, uh, started talking about CVP as not a good measure of the decision-making process, and that there is the oliguria is not a good measure to give fluids. And we were asking people why they give fluids. They gave fluids just because, in multiple ways. And what was really funny in Phoenicia was that even when the people who tested fluid responsiveness gave fluids and afterwards, or when they tested fluid responsiveness, and the answer from the fluid responsiveness parameter was no, they gave fluids. So, you know, it, it, it seems that we still need to have time in between when thinking, having data, and it lags behind. So I believe the fact that we were talking about rational fluid therapy, like last decade uh, will, bring us, uh, will bring us to change our habits at the bedside. And when you look on the data that early norepinephrine, early vasopressors are being used in sepsis, we, change, we are changing the guidelines. And I think this is now happening. So we are now considering fluids more like a drugs. We are returning back to the shock being norep uh, responsive and not only fluid responsive. So I hope that if we will do a Fenice 2 in two, day, in two years or five years, we will see different results. I hope so, but I'm not convinced. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, I think here is a question. What about cardiac surgery patient? Is a particular population we can use uh, 
tool like flu fluid accumulation index or vascular leak index in this kind of patients? You know, um, basically, it's it's a severe population. So in these, the field the fluid accumulation is much more severe. Um, I can't give you answer on the fluid accumulation index. I can give you answer on the vascular leak index because there are no data. But my opinion, because it's a cardiac surgery, it will be very difficult to, to use the vascular leak index because it's based on hematocrite. So there will be a change in hematocrite induced by bleeding. So this will be very difficult in this. But, uh, and regarding the fluid accumulation, as I've mentioned in the beginning or during my talk, if you have someone who is bleeding, you are actually giving fluids to replace in the vasculature. And the fluid accumulation index gives you an information what goes in and what goes out. So you should look at it more as a reserve capacity of the kidney or the severity of, of the kidney issue than really of the, uh, of the accumulation itself. So it tells you, yes, this patient is accumulating fluids. It doesn't give you an answer whether he accumulates it intravascularly because of bleeding or interstitially because of the leak. So this is something you, you should look at your patient. And also we have, we are not treating indexes, we are treating patients. So it's a special population, a severe one, and these are the uh, disadvantages of the of the parameters I've told, spoke about. I would like to add a few comments about this setting, that uh, when we talk about cardiac surgery patients, uh, we have only a few studies of cardiac output guided fluid uh, replacement. So there is a subset uh, of studies that we should look uh, better to improve our fluid assessment on cardiac surgery patients. We have much more evidence in non-cardiac surgery patients in the last years, and we should focus uh, on this subset of patients because of hypermobility and vascular tone. Uh, definitely, definitely a good, good, good answer to it. But you know, it's, uh, at the end of the day, we are treating patients not indexes, not balances. These are severity warning signs for us. Uh, there is also a question about the relevance of uh, peripheral edema as a sign of uh, fluid accumulation. Do you consider it or how? Do okay, I don't know if I don't talk, uh, if I don't yeah, you, you will. Give, give, uh, if I don't go into the talk Spoil. of Daniel, Spoil. Yeah. If, if I'm not spoiling, you know. Uh, basically, it depends on the time when the, uh, when the, when the peripheral edema uh, like uh, um, are occurring and uh, so from, from this point of view, there will be a difference in the early or in the late development of peripheral edema. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, a global edema is not a normal sign. So it's a sign of severity. I think we have time for a last question. Here is, a, what's your opinion about the use of the vascular leak index in patients requiring ECMO support? Requiring ECMO? Yeah. Oh, then it's, it's, it's twice as much. It's, it's, it's square uh, to those in the cardiac surgery. Of course, uh, you will have a problem with, with the hematocrite bleeding and pos possibly also uh, the, the risk of hemoly hemolysis in ECMO patients. So, so definitely not. Okay. I think, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.